how the Roman army tried to wipe Christianity out and failed. The history of Christianity is not one of faith only, but also one of perseverance and resilience. Looking back at the roots of the church, we can conclude that the antagonism she had had to endure in her early days speaks volume of the indestructibility of the Christian faith. Anyone who knows the story of the ancient Roman civilization at the peak of her world dominance knows of the remarkable strength and power she wielded. Rome had the will and ability to totally quash anything that was perceived as contrary to her laws and customs. And you can easily imagine that the little pockets of sparsely distributed, growing Christian communities in the massive Roman Empire, composed primarily of slaves and ordinary men, stood no chance of surviving the wrath of this magnificent hegemony. However, against all odds, the influence of this frail, unarmed group grew, overtook, and outlived that of Rome. Despite the ferocious attempts to wipe out Christianity, Rome failed but the Christian faith endured, even without the use of swords and staves. What factors precipitated these hostile cultural, political, and social situations for the Christians of that time? And how were they able to survive it? More importantly, what lesson can we learn from the resilient lives of these inspiring Christians of the early church? In today's video, I want to take you back in time, several centuries back, to live feel and experience what the beginning days of Christianity was like. I want to take you back to the formative years of Christianity and give you a glimpse of the nature of the caliber of men and women who ran the first lap of the Christ race. I know you are thrilled already because I already am. It promises to be an exciting journey, so buckle your belt up and get ready to ride. Chapter 1. Rome's Hostility background and motivation. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Christ had said, I will build my church and the forces of hell will not be strong enough to destroy it. Acting in his prophetic office, Jesus had predicted decades before the imminent oppositions that Christianity would be faced with and the innate resilience that would be exhibited by the early Christians during this process. Consequently, and true to form, torrents of persecution would crash against them in the years following the prediction. The central message of Jesus' oracle was straightforward. The impending opposing force would not win against the church. However, as is common with most prophetic utterances, the granular details were exempt. Nobody, from the moments Jesus made those predictions, knew for a fact the full picture of how the eventual details would unfold. Christianity has changed much today. If you lived in the first century as a Christian, one of the words that would pop up regularly in your day-to-day -day conversations would be persecution. This is because persecution was such an integral part of the Christian experience in those days. To be a Christian meant to sign up to be persecuted and maligned by a society that had little or no tolerance for your religious beliefs. Before Christianity came into Rome's notice, it first came under fire by Judaism. The religious leaders at Jerusalem had labeled it an heretic Jewish sect. The Romans had the same idea too. They thought of Christianity as a mere spark of aberrant Jewish religious beliefs at first. However, the Roman authority would begin to become seriously disturbed when this spark built up into an inferno that was spreading rapidly across the entire length of the empire. Political Motivation Ironically, it would interest you to know that the ancient Romans had great tolerance for other religions that weren't theirs. They allowed and recognized the liberty of worship in their colonies so long as the religions did not inspire seditions and gave allowance for the practice of emperor worship, which was considered an essential civic duty. For the Romans, everything they did was with the intent of maintaining the power structure they had worked and warred so hard to create. Every religion was expected to contribute to the stability and progress of the empire in any way, shape, or form. 
Therefore, you would understand why they were not so accommodating of a religion that swore its allegiance to only one Lord and preached of the establishment of another kingdom by their Lord that would topple all other reigning kingdoms in the world. This political motivation was the primal reason for the persecution of the early Christians. The Christians' loyalty to their unseen Lord was effectively an irritant to the political sense of the Romans. Christians refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord or offer incense to him. They refused to join the Roman army. They were essentially aloft and politically detached. Therefore, a prejudiced mind could easily mistaken them for separatists. Religious motivation. Another cause for the persecution of Christians was the perception the authorities had of their religion. You might find this hard to believe, but the early Christians were tagged atheists. Comical, isn't it? Yes, comical, but true. They were labeled atheists and they suffered greatly because of this. You see, in ancient times, much of religion was associated with the external. Invisible and spiritual ideas held no significance, religious meaning to them. Neither did internal virtues. The Romans had a temple erect with compartments called niches, where the different gods of the different nations they had conquered were housed. It was more like a house for many gods. Each god, physically represented as an idol, sat in its own niche. But the Christians had no physical object to tie their god to. They claimed he was invisible. And that was just too much for the Romans to understand. Hence, they were regarded as a people without a god, or in modern parlance, atheists. In addition to this religious slur, Christians were held in contempt because they were believed to indulge in incestuous practices. Of course, this wasn't true. It was just another misunderstanding. The accusation was born out of the fact that most Christians related with each other in endearing familial terms. They called themselves brothers and sisters, so the Romans did not know what to make of it when a man and a woman who called themselves by these terms lived as a couple. They frowned upon it as immorality at its peak. Closely linked to this was the charge of cannibalism. The Romans misunderstood the practice of communion as the eating of literal flesh and the drinking of real blood. Again, they could not understand how this translated to bread and wine. On these misconstrued grounds, Christianity did not align with the religious sensibilities of the ancient Romans. Hence, this became another source of tremendous pain and hurt for the church of the first and second century. Social motivation, however, beyond the political and religious motivations for the persecution of the Christian church, the social perception about these Christian communities also did not do much to shield them from hostility. At the time, people lived in what was called a caste system. The sense and experience of that might be a bit lost to us today. However, in those days, people were socially stratified. Everyone wasn't exactly equal in the sight of the law. For the sake of our conversation, let's divide them up into three. At the top of the pyramid sat the emperor and his family, and at the base of the order were the slaves. In between these were the hoi polloi, the masses who would comprise everyone from the aristocrats and common citizens to the soldiers and freed slaves. The slaves were at the bottom of the rung. One source estimates that there were about 60 million of them in the heydays of the Roman Empire. Generally, many of the members of the church were lower class members and slaves in the society. The upper class aristocrats treated with disdain these lower class figures who abstained from the regular temple worship, theaters and recreational events. To complicate matters, the Christians taught that there was no social distinction between slaves and freedmen. You can imagine how deeply this theology must have irritated the authorities and citizens of Rome. The menial works that slaves did was a vital sustaining force in maintaining the prosperity of their empire. To temper with this prevailing social order was to strike at the heart of the comfort and opulence the higher-ups enjoyed. This was another subtle motivation for the waves of persecution that would hit the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul says that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
He says this because God in his infinite wisdom began the church with common and low standing people so that humanity would realize that the survival of the church under the heat of Roman persecution and for all time has nothing to do with the caliber of men in the church, but the soul preserving work of God. Chapter two, Rome's hostility, waves of tyranny and the early church's fortitude. The first organized persecution of Christians by the Roman state was under the reign of Emperor Nero. After the great fire of Rome that burned for six days, Emperor Nero needed someone to peg his incompetencies on, and he found the unpopular Christian communities as a cop-out. It was easy for him to push the blame on Christians because they were already pent up societal animosity toward Christians due to their exclusivity and refusal to pay homage to Caesar as deity. After unjust trials, reminiscent of Christ's unjust trial before Pilate, Christians in the city of Rome were crucified, burned on stakes, covered with animal hides to fight wild beasts in stadiums, and pitched with gladiators in arenas. These were real men and women, boys and girls who were killed for sports on account of their faith. In the words of the historian Tacitus, they were victims of the ferocity of one man. The persecution was fierce and lasted for about four years, but it was only confined to Rome. In response, some persecuted saints fled Rome, while others established underground church communities to stay out of the watchful eyes of the authorities. The result of this dispersion was the further propagation of the Christian faith in the cities where they fled to seek refuge. Those who remained in Rome developed a well-structured system of meeting underground in catacombs and private homes. The wisdom of this structure and style of fellowship would prove invaluable to the survival of Christianity as the waves of persecution ebbed and flowed in succeeding generations. Nero's malignity toward Christians would initiate a trend of sporadic oppression that would continue for almost two centuries. In about 90 AD, Christians were once again spotlighted this time for refusing to offer incense in acknowledgement to the divinity and brilliance of Emperor Domitian. Domitian, a rather megalomaniac character in his declining years as emperor, ordered that Christians be persecuted. Some were martyred and others were exiled. This persecution was the event that led Apostle John to the Isle of Patmos as a slave. Domitian's tyranny only lasted for about six years. After Domitian, came Trajan, then came Hadrian, then Antoninus Pius, then Marcus Aurelius, then Septimus Severus, and on and on they went, each coming with his own breath of hostility toward the Church of God. Finally, after suffering a season of empire-wide persecution under Emperor Diocletian, the worst of its kind, Christians would have some respite in the late days of Galerius who signed an edict to grant tolerance to Christians in the empire. A breath of fresh air came for the church after the miraculous conversion of Constantine. The exact cause and nature of events leading up to Emperor Constantine's conversion are still very much in debate today by scholars. But it was miraculous that a pagan autocrat with a long line of fanatic predecessors behind would jettison his own gods and embrace the god of an unpopular sect don't you find that miraculous? Well, it is. God had sovereignly worked on his heart and converted him to further his purposes on the world. With Constantine's conversion came the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, and Christians had the liberty to build churches and spread the gospel in an empire that was ruled by a brother in the faith. Did you notice what happened to the church as each emperor came and placed its own weight of tyranny on her? she grew stronger and stronger under the weights of them. Remarkably, I mean, how else could this be explained outside of the preserving influence and power of God? There are no other plausible explanations. There are no records in history that the church advanced by mounting an armed opposition to the Roman authorities, or that members of the church lobbied their way in the corridors of politics through protests or other civil demonstrations to attain the level of eventual success and global reach that she had. With no resistance, the church endured, grew, and marched out of that season of gloom into an era of freedom to preach 
and spread the truths of God in the entire Roman and the world at large. Chapter 3 The Early Church's Fortitude A Metaphor of Our Personal Strength I know you must have found the story of the survival of the church fascinating. I do too. However, the truths of how the church could survive such antagonism is not far-fetched. In fact, if you look inwards deeply, you would find something of the enduring character of the church in you too. It is a general principle in nature that source determines essence. The essence of a thing cannot be separated or understood apart from its source. The character of the collective church is a reflection of our personal attributes and capabilities as Christians. The church was resilient in its infantile days and weathered the harsh storm of tyranny by the Romans. But you are not any different. Do you know that the story of the church's tenacity is a metaphor of the capacities that are within you too? There is no hostility that you can't trudge through as a child of God. The persecution of the early church was effectively physical. They had soldiers hounding them from city to city. They bravely faced Rome's assaults, enduring tremendous physical pain from wipes, clubs, and swords. But ours are different today. Remember, I had said earlier that persecution is an inseparable part of Christianity. Therefore, we experience persecution today in our own way too. The form or intensity might vary, but persecution is a perennial part of our Christian experience. For you, being ostracized at work or called names simply because you identify with God is persecution. Losing your job because your righteous ideologies do not conform to those of the world is persecution too. Being imprisoned because of your standing for Jesus or upholding the truth, that is persecution also. Struggling to not drown in the cesspool of immorality that surrounds us in this digital world and taking a stand for righteousness are persecutions in a sense. This is because the world continually seeks to assault your soul with its corrupting influences. As born again children of God, you have the innate strength of character and resilience to stand firm in the face of these adversity because you are a part of God's enduring church. Therefore, as the church outstood the raging Roman Empire, you can also outstand your challenges today. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The one in you is God. God resides inside of you with all his power, strength, and majesty. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 emphasizes the same truth about us. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Did you see the consistency of thought in these two passages? There is someone inside of you and that person is God. This was why the early church did not cower in the corner or chicken out when Rome charged at them with its full might. They knew someone greater than Rome was domiciled within them. They understood that ultimately the Christian wins. Yes, ultimately you win. So do not be weighed down by the things happening around you now. Believe me, you are built for it. You will not crack under the pressure of it. Instead, you will discover that it only came to make you stronger and stronger after the storms cease and the clouds clear out in the sky. Like the early church, you are built to last and outlast the challenges that stare at you. Chapter 4. Conclusion Tertullian said these words, The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. He was saying in essence that each time we are buffeted, we gain the potential to grow and expand as an influence. With each blow, each strike comes the possibility for exponential growth. Therefore, we are most advantaged when we are assaulted by the world, for buried in our pains are seeds that would eventually rise to be giant oaks, testimonials to the unending life that we carry. As phoenixes from the ashes of our burning lies the breaking out of a stronger, greater life form, look at the church and see a mirror image of yourself in her. You are stronger with each persecution that comes your way. You will not be overcome by the contradictions that surround you. If anything, you will rise out of it a stronger, more glorious being than when you first entered into it. The script of your life has been written and rehearsed before your sight in a metaphor by the history of the resilience of the church. So, 
Do not fear the challenges that are around you. You will certainly emerge victorious. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for all the thoughts of greatness and goodness that you have toward me. You have enriched me in ways unimaginable by giving me yourself. Today I declare that you reside inside of me and that my life is a testimony of the enduring patience that you work inside and through people. God, help me to understand that you have made me victorious and that no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. Keep me conscious of the reality that in all these things I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Amen.